Last time we saw Bagramian strike Rouse's 3rd Panzer Army, slicing through a huge number of German formations and reaching the coast around Memel. This move cut Army Group North off in northern Latvia. Schoener raced to form a line whilst trying to evacuate the Riga area. The potential of a breakout or link-up was discussed, but this fell through, simply because it was impractical under the circumstances. Now Army Group North is cut off from the Reich. What will the Germans do? Will the Soviets crush them? And did everyone just give up on Army Group North? Let's find out. In light of the situation, the fact that there was now a definite split between Army Groups North and Centre, command of 3rd Panzer Army was handed over to Army Group Centre on the 11th of October. Army Group Centre had its work cut out for it, as not only had it been devastated over the last few months, and some of its most powerful forces were currently trapped in Memel, but the Soviet 39th Army was heading straight for Tilsit, inside German territory. For the first time in more than three years of conflict, the war on the Eastern Front was about to come home to the Germans. But there was more immediate issues to deal with in Army Group North. In the Riga area, the Soviets kept up the pressure on the withdrawing National Socialists. The 87th, 132nd, 205th and 227th Infantry and the 563rd Volksgrenadier Divisions were harassed constantly in the retreat back to the Daugava River. Rengler's 227th Infantry Division was designated the rearguard formation in front of Riga. They covered the two remaining bridgeheads as the other units fled across the bridges and ferries. Strachwitz's 87th Infantry Division also acted as a rearguard, holding the flank at the mouth of the Daugava River. The overall situation for the Axis, though, was grim. With an entire army group surrounded by the Soviets, it was now vital that the Germans hold on to Liepaja and Ventspils, where supplies could be flown in and evacuees could be flown out. No matter what happened, they had to hold on to these ports, otherwise they would face a fate similar to that of the 6th Army at Stalingrad two years earlier but on a much larger scale. This was why both cities were now declared fortresses, although Liepaja was perhaps more crucial because Ventspils was too small to support the entire army group. This was why great effort went into forming a line in this area to prevent the Soviets taking it on the march. However, a front line of some sorts had been formed. This was bad news for Bagramian, who was pushing 6th Guard's army towards the port. Realising this, Schoener ordered 3rd SS Panzer Corps to the Preculé area in order to reinforce his weak line. Coincidentally, this corps, and it seems all three Panzer divisions in Army Group North, would also make up the units for his attack towards Memel, as discussed last episode. Operation Gaia, or Vulture, with 4th, 12th and 14th Panzer, plus 11th, 126th and 87th Infantry Divisions would strike along the coast towards 28th Army Corps' pocket. Yes, one pocket was going to break through to another pocket. Just let that sink in for a moment. Now, it's not clear, but it seems that Salkin's 39th Panzer Corps was meant to take overall charge of this attack, which was to begin on, or possibly before, the 17th of October. But 3rd SS Panzer Corps was also there, so maybe Salkin was to be in overall command, while Steiner just controlled the Panzer Divisions. 
Uh, either way, 3rd SS Panzer Corps still had to withdraw from Riga, gather their strength, and stop the Red Army from taking the ports. So the question is, would 3rd Panzer Corps be able to arrive in time, defeat 6th Guard's army's strike towards Liepaja, and then have the strength to strike south to Memel? Meanwhile, at Salma on the 10th of October, German forces had formed the new defensive line, blocking the entrance to the peninsula. Because their previous attempts to break through this line had failed, the Soviets decided to land behind them. On the 11th of October, Soviet Estonian infantry, supported by light tanks, disembarked at the Lu Lighthouse in an attempt to outflank the main German line. Accounts of this fighting are vague, but it appears that the Germans spotted the landing and reacted quickly. Only a small number of Soviet troops and tanks actually reached the shore, and those that did were targeted by the 23rd Artillery Regiment, and then counterattacked by Uhlenberg's 67th Infantry Regiment. Uhlenberg's men managed to knock out the light tanks with anti-tank weaponry and beat back the Soviet infantry in close quarters fighting. Despite their best efforts, the Soviet bridgehead was completely annihilated. On the 12th, a second landing was attempted in the Tisu area by the 300th Rifle Regiment. They were beaten back by 386th Infantry Regiment, supported by the 218th Engineer Battalion and 531st Naval Artillery Battalion. After this failure, Soviet forces on the island, 8th Estonian Rifle Corps and 30th Guards Corps, took a break from their attacks between the 13th and 16th of October. The Germans used this opportunity to load the staff of the 218th Infantry Division onto transports and ship them to Ventspils. Schoener planned to evacuate the Baltic Islands since a defence of the Schwarber Peninsula appeared pointless, and the Soviets had a clear manpower and material superiority. However, at the current moment, he thought that holding on for a little longer would tie up additional Soviet forces. This was perhaps why elements of Weber's 12th Luftwaffe Field Division were sent to the island as reinforcements. The Sox 43rd Army Corps, which was also responsible for the defence of Northern Kurland, now took command of the units at Schwaber. Meanwhile, 3rd SS Panzer Corps had arrived in the Prekuli area, where 14th Panzer Division battled with Soviet troops. The Netherland Panzer Grenadier Brigade reinforced 11th Infantry Division and helped stall the Soviet attack in that area. But the Soviets seemed to be gaining ground. As 6th Guards Army tried to advance though, they were hit on their eastern flank by 4th and 12th Panzer Divisions, striking from the Ventra River area. They held against the Panzers and managed to break through 61st Infantry Division's lines between 3rd SS Panzer Corps and the two Panzer Divisions, but were ultimately unable to exploit this and couldn't advance to Liepaja. Bitter fighting would continue for the next couple of days, but ultimately this limited attack would force 6th Guard's army onto the defensive. Meanwhile, on the night of the 12th to 13th of October 1944, Wengler's 227th Infantry Division withdrew from their bridgehead, leaving Riga to the Soviets. They blew up the last bridge at 0144 hours on the 13th. At the same time, Strachwitz's 87th Infantry Division withdrew overnight from the enemy side of the Daugava River. By 5 past 5 in the morning on the 13th, they were across the river, and thus were the last to leave that side. Major General Rodinov's 245th Rifle Division moved into Riga from the north, while Colonel Kuchinev's 212th Rifle Division marched in from the east. And another capital fell to the Red Army. 
Because it was no longer needed, Third Baltic Front was now disbanded. But yes, the Germans had finally withdrawn into the Riga East positions on the 13th. Operation Donner was over, as was the escape from the East. However, the war was not over. Army Group North had now fallen back into Kurland, and the Kurland Pocket had been formed. This is where they would stay, hemmed in by the Soviets until the end of the war. The enemy's Kurland group continued to block on the peninsula until the end of the war and surrendered in May 1945. Oh, okay. I guess it's the end of the series. No, nope, I wouldn't do that to you. But Werner Haupt, exclamation man, is really not happy with this statement and practically spits his dummy out of the pram. This sentence is found in the official work of the Soviet Ministry of Defense about the Second World War. Sixteen words reported about the last seven months of war in the Kurland area. A single insignificant sentence handles the commitment of two German armies and an army group. Sixteen words to also describe the battle of three enemy army groups with, at time, 19 armies. The war in Kurland between October 1944 and May 1945 was either insignificant to the writer of the history, or it was senseless. Which is it? Well, Mr. Hapt, from the Soviet perspective, Kurland wasn't the priority. Berlin was. They weren't fighting this war for the fun of it, nor were they aiming to have a picnic on the shore of the Baltic Sea besides vent pills. In the grand scheme of things, Kurland was just an insignificant area on the map, and it would be senseless for them to waste a lot of effort in taking it. Now, there was a whole German army group in Kurland, and this is a lot of troops. But just because the Axis were committed there, doesn't mean that the Soviets should commit there too. Other than to destroy Army Group North, what exactly would be the purpose of them taking Kurland? And would Army Group North's destruction help them get to Berlin? It seems unlikely. In reality, dealing with two German armies in a pocket just didn't concern them to any great extent. Yes, writing only 16 words about the entire conflict isn't great, and helps explain why I've struggled to create this series, since little is written about it, but... It's not the only history on this battle that does this. In fact, numerous authors do this all the time. Finding books on this topic in English is like digging for buried treasure without a map. Many histories like Glantz's When Titans Clashed, Satino's The Wehrmacht's Last Stand, and Hastings' Armageddon, some of these written from the German perspective as well, either give it a few lines or a few paragraphs. They don't talk in depth about this event at all. Why? Because Army Group North played no role in the fighting for the Reich. In the grand scheme of things, this was just a sideshow. And like most sideshows, they're not as important as the main events. Now, that's not to say it isn't interesting, or entertaining, or that it should be ignored completely. As we're going to see, the battles for Kurland are interesting and fun to debate about, as are such sideshows as the battles in the North African Campaign, Italy and Sicily, East Africa, and any other area of the war that isn't the Eastern Front. A lot of people think that these are all pointless to look into, and that since the entire war was won on the Eastern Front alone, completely by the Soviets apparently, all focus should be on the Battle of Kursk, or Stalingrad, or Berlin. And no, just because something wasn't the main event doesn't mean that it's not important, or interesting, or not worth looking into. All these events, just like Kurland, are important and interesting in their own right, and it's a shame people are obsessed with the one or two big battles that supposedly changed the course of the war. Because this obsession with the big battles means that you're buying books and documentaries on those few battles. This means historians are focusing on these battles, releasing book after book on the same subject over and over in order to line their pockets with the money you're willing to hand over. 
and numerous really interesting battles and campaigns are being ignored, some of which may also change our perception of the war or the people who fought in it, but we don't hear about them because nobody's buying books on these subjects, so nobody's wasting time writing about them. Army Group North being trapped in the Kurlan pocket and unable to assist in the defence of the Reich was both senseless and insignificant. Therefore, it's no wonder many of the books sum up the events by saying the army group held on in the pocket until the end of the war. Because, in a nutshell, that's exactly what happened. But, even so, that doesn't mean that this event isn't important or interesting to talk about and discuss. As we will see, I think there's a lot we can learn about the mind of that madman Hitler by looking into these events and the mind of someone else as well, but I won't spoil it. Now, we've already looked at whether Army Group North could have avoided being caught in the pocket, and the answer appears to be no, they couldn't really have avoided it. We also know they're trying to break out of the pocket, but that attempt fails. So, the question authors go to next is, why the Germans didn't just evacuate the pocket? Could they have evacuated Army Group North via the Baltic Sea? This is a massive debate, and we're going to be discussing this over the next few videos, as we see the events unfold. But right now, as the pocket was formed, Guderian, chief of staff of the OKH, now suggested to Hitler that they should evacuate the troops from Kurland. He said that despite their weakened state, the troops in Kurland would be more effective being deployed in East Prussia or elsewhere, more directly in the defence of the Reich. Hitler refused, stating that the morale of the Baltic SS soldiers would drop if the Axis abandoned the Baltic. He also said that Kurland would be a good position for future offensives. The Nazi leadership didn't permit the use of the term Kurland Pocket, as it implied that the Germans were trapped there. That led quickly to comparisons with Stalingrad, with consequent negative effects on morale. The approved term was the Kurland Bridgehead, as this suggested that Kurland would be a springboard for a new offensive driving east again once the present difficulties had been overcome. Now, many say that this is Madman Hitler again, but think about the context. Hitler had ordered Operation Gaia, the strike towards Memel, at this stage. Schoener had been moving troops and preparing to mount this offensive in conjunction with the troops in East Prussia to link up with Army Group Center. So Hitler wasn't abandoning the troops in Kurland, and his offensive ambitions were immediate not off sometime in the distant future. At this moment, with Riga still in German possession and the troops in no position to flee to the ports and sail away, and with a potential link-up still possible, why would Hitler agree to an evacuation? Whether the evacuation of Kurland was possible or not is a question we'll come back to, but right at this moment, Axis forces in the Kurland and Riga areas were in no position to evacuate even if they had wanted to at this time. So, if Hitler was a madman, he probably wasn't a madman at this moment, and Guderian's suggestion at this time was simply wishful thinking. Luckily for the Germans trapped in Kurland, they had the advantage of terrain. The Kurland pocket in October 1944 had a front of around 200 kilometers from the Riga area to the area south of Liepaja on the Baltic. The land in Kurland is mostly flat and swampy, with hundreds of lakes and streams and forests all over the place. There aren't many roads through this terrain, meaning that there were plenty of opportunities to funnel the enemy into pre-made killing zones, favouring the defender. So overall, it was a good place for Army Group North to be trapped in. 
plus the fact that two German armies had been squeezed into what was a relatively short front of just 200 kilometers, which offered no way to outflank it except by amphibious assaults, also played into German hands. Axis forces inside the Kurland pocket were hastily fortifying their positions. 18th Army consisted, from west to east, of the 126th, 11th, 30th, 61st and 225th Infantry Divisions, plus the 563rd Volksgrenadier Division, which had 14th Panzer Division in support. In the middle of the front was Army Detachment Grasser, from west to east, this had the 32nd Infantry, 19th SS, 21st Luftwaffe, 29th and 122nd Infantry Divisions, 4th and 12th Panzer Divisions were also in this area. Next, we have the 93rd, 24th and 290th Infantry Divisions as part of 6th SS Corps. Then, the 281st Security, 227th and 205th Infantry Divisions up to the coast at the Gulf of Riga, which were under Corps Group Kleffel's command. And behind the lines, 12th Luftwaffe and 83rd Infantry Divisions and Combat Group Gerok protected the coast in northern Kurland along with 43rd Army Corps. But also, on the 15th of October, 18th Army's commander, Boerge, held a meeting with the commanders due to take part in Operation Gaia, the strike to the south. It was realised that their own preparations had to be hasty, because the Germans knew that the Soviets were planning a new offensive in their area. And this was true. The overall aim now for the Red Army in the area was to take the port city of Liepaja, which, as mentioned, would cause massive logistical issues for Army Group North if it was to fall. Bagramian's 1st Baltic Front, consisting of 6th Guards and 51st Armies, were to break through from the Vainoda to Skodas area towards Liepaja. Then, to the east, 1st Shock Army in the Ormala area would strike against the German left flank, aiming for Tukums. Yeremenka's 2nd Baltic Front, consisting of 3rd Shock, 42nd and 22nd Armies, planned to strike out of the Dobela area to the west. 61st Army and 5th Guards Tank Army were held in reserve. Meanwhile, on the 16th of October 1944, two Soviet armies crossed the East Prussian border, aiming towards Gombinden. All effort now went to defending the Reich from invaders on all sides, leaving Army Group North to fend for itself. Considering that Operation Gaia was abandoned at this stage due to the Soviet attack on Kurland, and the fact that an overland connection was never established again, we'll no longer concern ourselves with the events in Memel or East Prussia. So, on the 16th of October, Soviet armies between the Gulf of Riga and Ventspils struck 16th Army and Army Detachment Grasser. The first battle of Kurland had begun. To the east, 1st Shock Army assaulted from the Yormala area against the German left flank. The Soviets also struck either side of Dobella, trying to separate 16th Army from Army Detachment Grasser and break through between Alsa and Saldus. This would cause the entire army group to collapse. Corps Group Kleffel with the 205th and 227th and 281st Infantry Divisions fought desperately to hold on, trying to prevent Tukums from falling. 6th SS Corps, with the 93rd, 122nd and 24th Infantry Divisions, was struck by the Soviet 12th Tank and 122nd Motorized Rifle Corps. These advanced with 13 divisions and slowly pushed the Germans back. To the west, intense artillery and airstrikes hit the area between Majiki and Skodas, after which 1st Baltic Front attacked. 
Von Bodehausen's 12th Panzer Division was committed near Majiki and managed to stabilise the situation there. 30th Infantry and the Nordland Division on its right fought hard to stop the enemy between Vaindon and Skodas. At one point, the Soviets broke through the Nordland Division's lines, and 30th Infantry had to send a regiment in to plug the gap, along with parts of Betzel's 4th Panzer Division. 14th Panzer Division and the 563rd Volksgrenadier Division were sent in to strengthen the line a little later. Making little headway, and with both sides suffering heavy casualties, the Soviets switched the offensive slightly east. Battles raged for control of a small hill, identified as Hill 65.3, which changed hands several times. Tanks broke through the trench defences, but the defenders mowed down the oncoming infantry. The tanks became isolated and were either destroyed or had to fight their way out. The 6th SS Corps held on for three days against the 13 Soviet divisions, supposedly only losing 1,050 men. They were pushed back though, as were 16th Army Corps, with Dobella being lost and the front moving to the east of Tukums by the 19th of October. Also in the afternoon of the 19th of October, Soviet artillery fire and airstrikes hit the German defenders on Sarama, and then Soviet riflemen assaulted. German losses were high. Only small combat groups now existed, which defended behind the tattered wire defences. 50% of the officers fell on this day. Lieutenant General Schirmer and his operations officer, Colonel Neopold, stood on the front line. Colonel Reuter, commander of the 386th Infantry Regiment, attacked the penetrating combat vehicles, along with a few soldiers armed only with a bazooka. I assume that's a mistranslation, is meant to mean a Panzerschreck. A counterattack was attempted. Schultz's 239th Naval Air Defense Battalion penetrated into the enemy front but the Germans had no choice but to retreat further down the peninsula. The Germans were now down to 4,620 men on the line, of which just 2,740 were trained infantrymen, out of 7,177 men left on the island. However, after eight days, 20th of October, the first Battle of Kurland was over. If you believe the German reports, huge numbers of Soviet tanks, somewhere in the region of 150, were taken out. I can't confirm how accurate this is, and I don't have the German losses, but it's true that the Soviets had barely advanced a mile in their thrust towards Liepaja, and it's noted that they'd taken heavy losses. But this had come at a price for the Germans too. By this point, some of the German units were at very low manpower levels. For example, by the 24th of October, a few days after the First Battle of Köln had ended, 4th Panzer Division was down to just 4,598 men, out of the 12,002 men it was supposed to have had. Of course, Army Group North had focused on defending Liepaja and had done so successfully, leaving weak forces in the east. These had fallen back, which prompted Schoener to send in military police units to question soldiers who had retreated without orders. Those found to have fallen back were hung. Bloody Ferdinand would not tolerate cowards in his army group. There was now a lull in the fighting so the Germans began to reorganise their lines and prepare their defences. 39th Panzer Corps, with the 61st Infantry Division, which had been held in 18th Army's Reserve, were transported to East Prussia, and Menkel took over the 329th Infantry Division. German infantry, assisted by Latvian civilians, dug foxholes, trenches, and created bunkers. Woods were cleared to allow unobstructed fields of fire. These areas were filled with mines, tripwires and explosive devices. 
strong points concealing anti-tank guns were set up, the killing zones precisely targeted so artillery gunners had the exact coordinates to respond to any change in Soviet battle tactics. The first battle of Kurland had been a successful defensive operation for the Germans and Axis forces, but it also meant that Army Group North was unable to attempt its breakout mission towards East Prussia, Operation Geyer. For better or worse, Schoener's men were now trapped in Kurland for good. So far, we've seen that it wasn't really possible for Army Group North to have withdrawn before its encirclement, nor break out towards East Prussia. However, now that they were encircled, surely there was no reason to stay there, right? Surely they would be transported to East Prussia. Surely the Kriegsmarine would evacuate them. There's no way that they'd have to stay in Kurland, unless Madman Hitler forced them to stay, right? Well, we'll see. Thanks for watching. Bye for now.